Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's Bruges Group meeting. Our two parliamentary representatives are currently voting and are hoping to be here at 7.15. But I will start the meeting now. Ruth Lee, uh, our first speaker, will be ready to address you shortly. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our Bruges Group meeting, held at a crucial time mm. in the Brexit process. It's almost two years to the day since 17 million of us voted to leave the European Union. But today, there are still those in Parliament working tirelessly to reverse the decision of the British people. Ironically, a number of Conservative MPs are calling for Parliament to have a meaningful vote on the details of the renegotiation, so Parliament can then mandate the government to make whatever concessions are necessary to keep us within the jurisdiction of the European Union. The reality is that these Conservative MPs who seek this meaningful vote would prefer us to be a vassal state yes. Yes. rather than for us to have a sovereign parliament. They are parliamentarians in name only. Yes. Yes. Now these Conservative MPs who seek this meaningful vote are the very people who for many, many years have rejoiced in the fact that our Parliament could have no meaningful votes over whole swathes of public policy, where the right to make our own laws had been ceded to the European Union. Their attempt to present themselves as defenders of parliamentary sovereignty is nothing but a fraud. Yeah. 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 Welcome, Eddie. You take a seat. The Bruges Group's criticism of the government is not that they are seeking to avoid a meaningful vote. The referendum and the 17 million votes in favour of leaving was the most meaningful vote this country has ever had. Our criticism of the government is that they have already conceded too much. It is now essential that there must be political control of and accountability for the negotiations being conducted in Brussels as a matter of urgency. A politician must be leading these negotiations on a daily basis and civil servants must be responsible to that person. Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have two of our speakers with us, and our first speaker uh, will be Ruth. Uh, Ruth has had an outstanding career as an economist in both the public and private sector. She has worked at the Treasury, the Department of Trade and Industry, and the Central Statistical Office. She has also been Chief Economist at Mitsubishi Bank, and is currently Economic Advisor and director of the Arbuthnot Banking Group. In the public policy field, she has served as the head of the policy unit at the Institute of Directors, been director of the Centre for Policy Studies, and director of Global Vision. It is indeed a privilege to have Ruth as one of our guest speakers this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please give a warm welcome 
to Ruth Lee. Thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here again. And I think the last time I was here actually was March 2016, which was three months before a certain event that presumably some of us voted to leave the EU. Well, I voted to leave the EU. I must admit, if I hadn't, I wouldn't be here tonight. But there we go. But I did actually look back at the speech I gave then, uh, and far from me to say that it was, a, it was quite a good speech, but I made several points that were opposite then and just as appropriate now. I remember the first point I made was that... Uh, can you hear me? Is that better? Is something wrong with the microphones? Sorry, is that better? I, I think I just have to direct it more to my um, height, which is lower than Barry's. But that, that's okay, is it? But I think the first point I made then was that why did I want to leave the European Union? I wanted to leave for democratic reasons. I wanted to live in a country that actually made its own decisions without being ruled or dominated by Brussels and the European Union. And I also said that when Remainers, and I use the phrase, I'm not quite sure whether I use the phrase Remainers, but those who didn't want to leave the EU, I'm very something's wrong with this, it's pruning. Yeah. Is it not? No? If you bring it closer to your mouth. Put it to my mouth. That's yeah, much really, better. Yeah, that's like much better. That. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, chance. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Gosh, I, I will get onto this speech in a minute. <laughs> but um, I was saying the people who didn't, now I'm popping. That's a technical term for when the peas actually pop into a microphone. But anyway, um, I don't know why this is such a problem. Um, but I, I said at the time that the people who didn't want to leave, I said they, they clearly did not have much faith in this particular country. They didn't seem to think this country would thrive. Um, yes, let's try another microphone. That's not very satisfactory, is it? Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> right, well that's the first half of my speech <laughs> um, But I think, as I say, I wanted to leave and I thought the country would thrive outside the European Union. Yeah. And those people who didn't want to leave, I, they obviously had no confidence in this country and they still have no confidence. Of course, I expected no better of people like Alistair Campbell or Peter Mundelson, but I think the way that the Lords has behaved has been absolutely shockingly disgraceful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have just been stupefied by their, their behaviour. Mm. The second point I made back in March 2016 was that uh, we, we as Brexiters were always accused that we weren't laying out exactly what, what sort of thing we expected if there were Brexit. What will the United Kingdom be like in five years' time if we leave the European Union? And my answer to that was, will you tell me what the European Union will look like in five years' time? Because my goodness, are there problems there. In fact, Brexit is probably one of their minor problems. Let's be honest about this. I mean, even over the last two years, the migration crisis in the EU has become much more toxic. And of course, we've seen the election of an anti-immigration government within Italy and in response to people's unhappiness about the migration into Italy. But even in Germany, that central country within the European Union, there are clearly big frictions because of the migration. And the CSU leader, Horst Seehofer, who also happens to be interior minister by happy coincidence, and of course is uh, Angela Merkel, CDU, that's her main part, uh, party member, her party coalition uh, member, he is actually saying, look, unless something is done about migration, we will put unilateral controls over it into Bavaria, thus threatening the actual existence of the German government. So don't tell me all is rosy in the garden in the European Union, because it isn't. And let's not forget that the, European, the Euro crisis has not gone away. Um, I went to some figures the other day. Believe it or not, the Greek economy is now 25% less than it was in 2007. Can you imagine? People go on about weak growth in this country, but we've got growth. 
of Greece, it's 25% lower than it was 10 years ago. And even in Italy, the GDP is 5.5% lower than it was <coughs> 10 years ago. So again, is it any surprise that the new populist coalition government in Italy is talking about kicking over the traces of austerity in order to get the economy going? But it will be in direct conflict with Brussels if it does that. This is going to be a very interesting development. But whatever. And I remember my third point, which I made then, was uh, discussing the um, UK, possible UK-EU relationship. And I absolutely said, no thank you to not the Norwegian solution. We must be out of the single market. We must have control over our immigration policy. And we must be a truly sovereign country able to make our own regulatory decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Why people think the single market is such a brilliant idea is absolutely beyond me. But of course, I don't think they do. It's just a trick. It's just a ruse to make life difficult for, for getting out of the EU. And I also said the customs union, no thank you. We must again be in a position where we can make our own trade deals and we can decide our own tariffs. And yet people still talk about wanting to stay in the customs union. What is wrong with them? Do they not understand what these things are or are they so blinded by their own remaining dogma? That they can't actually see beyond, that they, or they can't actually see beyond what they're saying and actually consider the, the, the country, the country's future. But I, dig, I digress. I digress. And then I think when I the fourth point I made was that, what's all right? What sort of relationship would I like with the European Union when we leave? I said, well, basically, you start with the WTO, the World Trade Organization rules. But if uh, you can negotiate a good free trade agreement based on tariff-free trade in goods, and there are only tariffs on goods, there aren't tariffs and services, and possibly something for the city for financial services, that's fine. And I said, but keep it simple. And I must admit, when Theresa May started to talk about a deep and special relationship with the European Union, I began to get slightly nervous because I don't really want a deep and special relationship with the European Union. I want a friendly relationship. I want a relationship that works on both sides. But actually, I want to live in an independent country. It's, it's not so good. It's uh, not hanging on to the coattails of Mr. Mr. Barnier or Mr. Yonka. And when people go on about, oh, well, a single market, again, I've discussed the single market, but, well, how can we possibly trade in WTO rules? I mean, that would be cutting ourselves off from access to, to the European Union market, which is our one of our biggest markets, our biggest market. You know, this will be economic death. Well, let, them, let me remind them that if you look at the exports over again in the last 10 years, they've grown by 30% to the European Union countries. They've grown by 93% to non-EU countries. Now, I need to tell you that actually the second figure is over three times as big as the first figure. <laughs> or perhaps people need this pointing out. In other words, this tells you that for all this access and all this marvellous you know, friendship and whatnot, actually what really determines trade, it is a growing prosperity in your markets and, uh, and, that, and, and that and commercial reality. Growing prosperity and commercial reality, that is what drives exports. <coughs> it's not some sort of quasi-religious organisation called the single market. It really is bizarre that this nonsense has taken over. And as a consequence, because of the changes in the, uh, the, the, in, in the growth rates, our share of our exports now going to the EU has dropped from 62% in 2007, and it's now actually under 50%, it's 49%. And doesn't that tell you something? Well, it tells me something, but there again, I'm a geek, but there we go. And I think the fifth point I made then, and it's equally valid today, that I'm, I said that we have a whacking great trade deficit with the European Union. Our goods deficit in 2017 was 95 billion pounds. 95, that's about 4.5% of our GDP. 
With Germany, it was 32 billion. That's the deficit. That's an awful lot of Mercedes cars, I would hasten to add. And yet, we've gone into these discussions with Mr. Barney as if we are the supplicant. We are the, we are, we are the ones. Oh, please, sir, may we have the crumbs under your table, Mr. Barney, because we really do want a relationship with you afterwards. Or as some wit said the other day, never mind crumbs under the table, what about empties under Mr. Juncker's desk? <laughs> but it is very, very discouraging. And so where are we now? Well, we know that uh, basically, as far as I can see, the negotiations, very little is happening. Yeah. The transition agreement was agreed in March, and I sort of was just about able to solve it. But since then, things have got slightly bogged down, and I suspect that the European summit, uh, which will be the 28th, 29th of June, very little progress will actually be, uh, uh, be chalked up. But Barney has said he wants this, you know, the future framework settled by October. Although I notice that if things get dragged on and drag on and drag on, there's more and more talk about being pushed into November or December. And boy oh boy, is that getting very close to 29th of March 2019. And of course, we still don't know even what sort of deal the government wants. Because there was going to be a white paper ahead of the summit, but that has now been postponed into July. Boy, oh boy, time is getting on. So, what sort of deal will we have? Will we have a deal? Who knows? It's got to be a jolly good deal to be worth 35 to 39 billion pounds, that's all I'll say. But if there is no deal, I do trust that the government really is making preparations for that eventuality. And there were some rumours the other day, or reports the other day, that in fact the uh, preparations had ground to a halt. Please, 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 this is not good enough. If there's no deal, we must be ready. But uh, there we go. However, um, I don't know how much longer you want me to go on. Should sure. we just go another five minutes? Yes, that's fine. Yes, um, we spent five minutes trying to get the microphone going. Um, but I, I really, I suppose because I'm an economist, I like discussing the economy. Well, that's a sort of weakness that some of us have. And um, just suffice to say, let's remind ourselves about the some of the nonsense that surrounded the whole EU debate in this country. I think it's been disgraceful, frankly. I mean, I try and be as honest as possible, but that's obviously not the, um, not the approach of the HM Treasury and various other departments. And I did start my career in the Treasury, as, as, uh, as Barry suggested, and I was appalled, uh, you know, ahead of the referendum when they came out with their project fear. And let me just remind you that they said that even a vote would throw the economy into recession, even a vote. And it would mean 500,000 extra unemployed. That is a disgrace. And they, I think that the Treasury has not adequately apologized for that incredibly misleading uh, product field. <laughs> um, it was scandalously, scandalously bad. And of course, he was, the Treasury was backed up by Mr. Carney and uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which is increasingly looking like a mini-me as it drags its little way around the airwaves. But there we go. Um, granted, the economy has changed since the Brexit vote. The pound did fall, but the pound was undervalued. And what happened last year in 2017? No, there wasn't a recession. Growth was nearly 2%. Already, uh, personal expenditure growth slowed down. Investment growth was up 4%. It didn't collapse, as we kept being told it would collapse. And actually, the real benefit was there was uh, exports grew faster than imports, and there was a slight rebalancing on the economy, which is all to the good. I mean, granted, uh, I think so far this year, growth has been a, a, a tad weak, but I do expect it to pick up. And one feature is very obvious indeed, that the labor market is still very, very strong. Real incomes are beginning to pick up, and as 2018 continues, then that should actually sustain growth as we go ahead. And all this, chaps, is despite Brexit. <laughs> are you sick of hearing that? 
I'm absolutely sick of hearing that. But then again, I keep being told, oh well, you know, we back back in uh, before the referendum, actually the bank and the OBR and all these, these worthy bodies have forecast faster growth than they forecast now, and therefore this is because of Brexit that we are growing slower. Let's be frank about this. Who puts any faith in their forecasts? I, for one, don't. And okay, growth is perhaps a little bit slower, but is it because of Brexit? I don't know, and let's be honest, they don't know. But the trouble is, when they make these utterances, and I'm particularly thinking of the Institute for Fiscal Studies the other day, people actually believe it as a fact. This is not a fact. This is just that they're just comparing two forecasts that are actually full of what we call errors. It is a disgrace. The debate has been an absolute disgrace. But I think my final remarks will be for all my despair at the <laughs> negotiations and the state of the negotiations, assuming we do leave on the 29th of March 2019, and all right, perhaps there is a deal, but let's pray, and pray, I think is probably the operative word, that we have a, some sort of deal that is not too restrictive in what this country can do. As I say, I want as free a deal as possible. <laughs> we can then decide on trade agreements and actually gear our trade even more than we are doing now to the fast-growing parts of the world. And the EU will not be a fast-growing part of the world, not least of all because of its demographics. Let's be absolutely clear about this. I'm not saying we should trade with the EU, I'm just saying that the growth ain't there. I mean, this has just been purely commercial in the way of thinking. And the second thing is, again, providing the deal isn't too restrictive, we should be able to amend and repeal some of the most restricted regulations. And we should, unless we stay in the single market, God help us, be able to control our immigration. And last but not least, there should be a Brexit dividend. And I say that despite Mr. Paul Johnson of the IFS the other day. Of course, there should be a Brexit dividend, and uh, Theresa May has obviously decided already that she's going to use it for the NHS. But is that a bad thing? Not necessarily, of course not. And really, if the government then goes on to make pro growth, pro business decisions that are right for this country, and it has the freedom to do that outside the European Union, I am very optimistic about this country. But we have to look forward, we have to be positive, and I would like to see the government be a little bit more positive about the future. <laughs> there are days when I can barely get up, I've just had so much of the negativity. But the, the future of this country is bright, yeah. and it will be brighter when we leave, and especially if we leave without too much clobber. End of story. Yeah. <laughs>